So uh, thank you guys to Quake Quays and, and, the, and the entire team for uh, just giving us an opportunity to share. I'm really glad you guys gave us the easy topic <laughs> Do <you really>? um, <laughs> because <clears throat> I think, um, you know, th this, it, it's funny because I felt like after what Denise shared, I was like looking at Arlene, I was going, <laughs> gosh, she, she shared our entire class. Let's just, <laughs> let's just have another icebreaker or something. But um we're, we're going to share a few things. And, um, you know, I think that um, we're going to share a lot from our lives. I mean, this is what we know how to do, which is um, you'll learn from some things that we've done that we believe might have helped our kids, as well as some maybe mistakes that we've done. Um, we'll share some scriptures. Um, really, our hope is that you will uh, learn a few things that you can implement. Um, I do believe, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, I do believe that it's never too late with your children. Um, and we're going to talk about various age groups as well. Um, so, um, but um, we will be talking about peer pressure. We'll be talking about how um, we prepared our children for peer pressure, especially when it comes to sex, drugs, and, and alcohol. And so, rock and roll. And rock and roll. And rock and roll. And rock and roll. <laughs> um, so I'm not even sure I, you guys know who we are now, right? Um, but he wanted to show the picture. But I, I really thought the picture was kind of cool. <laughs> uh, but but <clears throat> I, I really appreciated what the vendor shared. I, I was humbled by that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I sorry, let me go back. I was humbled by that. What, one of the things Arlene and I have always wanted to be, um, even prior to getting married, when we prayed about getting married, was that our family... Uh, would be a model for for those who were not uh, in the church with knowledge of Christ, and even those in the church. And so, um, I really feel blessed. I feel like I'm living my dream, where um, the four of us are a team, and um, and we don't do everything perfectly. You'll learn, but but we've got 30 years of marriage, 35 years of discipleship. Um, our two kids are nowhere near perfect. They'll, they'll be the first ones to tell you. We, we, we touched base with both of them about peer pressure and got some uh, good topic, uh, good, good things to share with you guys. But um, I think you guys know our kids in, in our family. Uh, I wanted to start off with this. Um, and this, you know, I'll share this because I had this idea, this theme. And then we talked to Cooper and Cooper was like, dad, if you can tell those parents anything, let them know that the lion never sleeps. And it, and it gave us goosebumps because that was, I already had this picture up. I already, I, I wanted to share with you that we do what we're doing in terms of our families, our marriages, everything we're doing in hostile territory. This is not our home. Um, we live in Satan's realm right now under God's protection, but um, we have to realize, we have to operate with a sense of urgency, not panic, but urgency when it comes to our children, because we do live in a hostile territory and, and our children are being stalked daily. I, I remember there was, there were a couple of things that I remember I would, I would drive my kids to school because my job allowed me to, right? So I, I worked from home, even pre- pre-COVID, and I decided I wasn't going to let my kids ride the school bus because I felt like that was like a shark tank. But I would drive them to school every day, and then I would pray with them or I would prepare them as they went off to school. I always felt like I was taking them to the lion's den. And you, you have to understand that our children are constantly being watched, constantly being stalked, waiting for their weakest moments. And it's in those weakest moments that our preparation and what we're going to talk about now is what is where they, where the rubber really hits the road. And I hope that this class, when we share some concepts with you, um, you know, we ask both our kids, um, you know, I think that um, one of the feedback that they gave us was that we have produced an environment where they were confident to say no. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, so we're gonna share some biblical concepts with you. We're gonna share some personal stories with you. I'm gonna start off first by kind of giving you an idea of how hostile the territory is. 
So I, I pulled some data and, and, and this data can, can, you know, data as it often does can, can say various stories. But um, when I looked at this, I, I was startled by the sheer volume of children in high school that have already reported use of marijuana. Um, the ones that reported using it within the last 30 days, right? So it wasn't just a, um, a casual thing. It was something that they were using regularly. Two million minors are using e-cigarettes, vaping, with a quarter of them using it every day, right? Um, this one shocked me. And I actually, I asked my kids about this one. 75 kids, 75% of the kids by age of 19 have had some form of sexual intercourse. And I, I shuddered at that because, and, and there's a reason why, and I've got a couple of points later that I want to talk about. I personally shuddered because I thought, I remember what I, the things that I did before I became a Christian and, and I became a Christian when I was 19 and I still had had things that I did that I am uh, shame, shamed full about, as well as I have those memories. They'll never leave my, my memory banks. And so um, these, are, these are stark numbers, right? Alcohol use. Um, and then the last one, I think that most predominant, most kids deal with some form of peel pressure at some point in their life. So what we're going to share, kind of in keeping with what Beth shared, is not going to be your typical class about just dealing with peer pressure. I'm going to ask you, bear with us, because we're, the foundation we're going to lay will help every single one of your kids be prepared for peer pressure. Yeah. So we will be discussing age from a variance from zero to 10 to 10 to 18 and so on. And so for those who have young children, for those who have kids in the womb, um, the reality is that peer pressure starts in the sandbox mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and all the way up to as married. Yeah. So if we think that our training stops at a particular time, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. And so we want to be able to cover that. But one of the starching and starkling, uh, what is it, kind of things that grabbed me when they said 90% of our kids have experienced peer pressure. And then when I looked at these numbers, all of us think, we were just talking about Ethan. Oh, he's just such a sweetheart, right? And we look at Katie, and we look, we look at our children and we're like, no, no, not my kid, right? Although sometimes some of us might say, yeah, my kid. But sometimes in our hearts, we all think our children are good and they are. It's what's around them, the temptations of life, right? The influences of life. And so therefore what we're praying and hoping, yeah, we're talking about pre pre peer pressure, but in reality, we're really trying to talk about helping their eyes see God at an early age. As many of us, when we were had babies, right, they were in our womb, we would play the Mozart, right, music Mozart, <laughs> or I think we've got to realize that from the womb to, to older age, we've got to still put God in the picture, and, and his stories always have to be forefront, and so that's something I just wanted to share very yeah, quickly. So the, the first thing um, we want you to think about is... Uh, is seeking connection, right? So the, the, when I talk about connection and, and when, I, when we talk about dealing with peer pressure, it, it has to start first with your connection to God, um, as well as then at, by extension, your connection to your children. This, like we, we really thought about this for a long time. We prayed about it and we said, what was it that strengthened our children during the hardest times. And it, it was ultimately the fact that each of us had a very strong relationship with God. And by extension, we sought connection with our children. That is how they dealt with the lion that was stalking them. They, they both faced peer pressure and they both in various things gave in. But most, you know, when we talked to them, they're like, no, we, we knew what you guys wanted from us. We knew what God wanted and we decided no. And so connection is something that is, is it, 
we talk about it. We um, sometimes maybe even trivialize it, but it's hard to, to maintain that connection. And, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to share, um, I won't share these scriptures, but I will ask you to go back and study this because in scriptures, we see, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I read the Bible, it's hard for me to find a good parent. I mean, if anything, I find more cautionary tales in scriptures than anything else. So, um, but I want to show you the chain because I believe sometimes what we do and what we expect of our children and how we, we, we train them and, and try to connect with them, we oftentimes do that through the lens of how our parents did it with us. Sometimes we do it with how our culture has done it for us. For us, it's our Hispanic culture. Um, I'll be the first to admit that early in our marriage and when we started parenting, I parented my kids the way my dad did, which was I yelled a lot. I raised my voice. If I felt like they weren't listening, I raised my voice. And I had to seek a lot of guidance from the scriptures and God, as well as some spiritual people around me. And realize that that was not um, the way to bring up my children. And so I, I think that oftentimes we, we, we parent because there aren't really good examples in the Bible, we parent from a standpoint of doing what we've always done, doing what our culture does, doing what, you know, we've seen our parents do, and, and we have to break that chain. So let me walk you through this chain really quickly, because, you know, this is a cautionary tale of, of how one parent's sin can cascade all the way down through generations. So we all know Abraham. Right, Abraham, we, we think of Isaac being the child of promise, but his first son was Ishmael. And, and he had Ishmael with his maid servant because he was impatient, waiting for God's promise. And <clears throat> instead of taking Ishmael into his home and treating him like the son that he was, he chose Isaac over Ishmael. And that was the beginning of a cycle because Isaac did the exact same thing. He chose Esau as his favorite because Esau was a man of the, the outdoors and a, and, a, and a hunter and strong. And, and he, he loved Esau more than Jacob. And what did Jacob do? Jacob, Jacob usurped it, deceiving him and taking the birthright. And then what did Jacob do? He parented the way he was parent and the way his grandfather parented. And, and Jacob favored Joseph. And, and that, you know, guys know the story of Joseph, how that led to his brothers, you know, wanting to kill him, sold, selling him into slavery. And you know the story. But this is the dysfunctional parenting will continue until we decide we're going to use these as cautionary tales not allow our parents what they did. And some of our parents were good. I'm not saying everything they did was bad, but I'm saying I inherited some negative habits from my parents and I had to go to God and to some spiritual people to correct some of that. I threw in Eli as well, because Eli with his wicked sons, he didn't allow, he was like an absentee dad. He didn't take action. Um, and, and so the reason why I share this is because the lack of connection that you see in the scriptures, I believe is something, you know, the lack of connection with their, with their children and the desire, they were not, you know, they were not following in the Deuteronomy six, you know, impress on your children, you know, uh, when you walk with them, when you lie down with them, they, they were not putting these things into practice. They were playing favorites. And so, um, I feel like connection to God and our children has to be our, our foundation with everything else we talk about, because like I said, connecting can be easy, but it's hard to do. And it's something that we all have to persevere in. So no matter what age group your kids are, you can persevere to connect with them and, and transfer that heart that you have. Thanks. Um, Connection and and here it says peer pressure versus perseverance. But really, I, I actually Cooper encouraged me to share something with 
with you all because I we asked our children about peer pressure. But I think the resonating word here is connection. And, you know, people could sit down and ask us, well, let's, you know, can we dive into, you know, how do I talk to my kid about sex? How do I talk to my kid about alcohol? The reality in the big picture, I hope that you're really gleaning from this already, is we've got to point them to God. And connecting with our kids means really like, understanding where they're at. Cooper said to me, you know, mom, it's not just telling us what to do. This generation, I was laughing. I was like, this generation, which is you. It's like, yeah, my generation. He's like, this generation doesn't want to be told. We really want you guys to connect with us and hear us out and meet us where we're at. So connecting, some of us, I think one of the things Steve shared about in our culture, being Puerto Rican, the, the girls stay with the girls, right? So mommy is with me and then my dad would, you know, help my brother and raise him and they talk about the Yankees. And so we thought it, it was a divide and conquer. That's not so much so. In reality, what we saw was, even though that was great, what we've seen is that there's a great connection with Stephen and Bailey. And the many times that Stephen would go to her room and maybe read a book with her and talk about her day, they connected. So he never did the Puerto Rican thing, which is, okay, you've got Bailey and I've got Cooper because of the genders. No, we cross gender. And so realize that your connection with your children doesn't have to be um, myopically or focused just on, I should say, that gender particularly. It's really connecting with them on a heart, soul, and mind level and seeking to understand them. I see that throughout the Bible. I really see that throughout the Bible that Jesus, when he met the Samaritan woman, or when he met the rich young ruler, right? Or whoever he met, he really, he really changed to meet that person's need, to meet and understand that person's character. So here in peer pressure versus perseverance, one of the things that you know, I realized is that one thing that Jesus really, really, really um, executed so well is that everybody is valuable. And so what our children really want to feel is value. What our children really want to feel is that they belong. And that's what Cooper said. He says, mom, we just want to belong to something kind of like not be missing out on something. Yeah, it's called FOMO, fear of missing out. And so we will try things because our friends do it, even though we know it was wrong. But the, us kids really just wanted to have either an extended family, if we didn't find that in our own family, or we wanted to find friendships, right, that we could call our little community. And so when you're thinking of that, dig deeper in and say, okay, let's talk about peer pressure. No, let's talk about teaching our children what perseverance is. We've got to arm our children to handle situations when it comes to them. That's, he, he told me, it was, it was the spirit, guys. I know with this, may you pray. I've seen the spirit show up in so many conversations that I have with Cooper tonight um, regarding this class that I was like, God wants us to talk about this. Because he talked about, don't tell us no when, oh, peer pressure is going to happen. It's how you handle it. No, teach us how to handle it. And it's teaching them how to persevere in that situation. And I want us to, to turn into uh, James chapter one, because I wanted to share a scripture there. But um, our children, um, basically, how is it that you would handle what someone would come to you? I wanted Stephen to share about um, an incident when his mother was trying to teach him how to say no to drugs. And that's arming your children. Yeah. So, so, so my mom used to, um, she would sit me down and she did this to each of us, but she would sit me down and, and I was like, gosh, I was like seven or eight. And she said, okay, if someone asks you what, you know, smoke a joint or drink something, what, what would you say? I'd say, well, no, she goes, that's not good enough because they're going to come back and they're going to call you names and they're going to say this and they're going to, so how would you, so she was doing behavioral based interviewing, <laughs> right. And preparing me and modeling for me how she goes, no, you have to say, no, I'm not going to do that to my brain. I'm not going to put that in my body. 
I want to be an athlete. I want to be someone who, you know, becomes a, a, an executive eventually. I'm not going to do that. And so she said, and then walk away. <laughs> and so she was preparing me and it was, it was perfect. It was perfect. Now, and then as an adult, my aunt mother taught me that if never take a drink from a guy, you buy your own drinks, but rather I don't want you to drink. So I got no, so she said that she still told my niece the other day, you know, the same thing. And she's like, no, no, I don't drink. But she's like, well, I, that's the advice I gave you. Your, I don't want none of you guys to drink. But so we could talk about the five stages of how to handle peer pressure and how and what that looks like. But the reality is handling peer pressure from zero to five is teaching the heart, like for your children when they're at the sandbox and they don't want to share their toys with those those kids because their kids their other friends were like don't play with them we shouldn't share with them what do you do to that zero to five year old child you're teaching them to do what's right well why shouldn't you share what how do you think that little boy feels and we have to have the time and that next that next point is timing is everything we've got to spend the time to nurture them so it's not and help them and walk them through it in a society like where we live right now in the United States, everything is so fast and quick. So as parents, I've fallen into this where I just want to say something and listen to me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, Cooper, I've got to talk to you this about this right now. He goes, mommy, I'm doing my homework. Or I'm like, okay, after you do your homework and it's 10 o'clock and he's taking a shower, Cooper, I got to talk to you when you get out of your shower. Mom, I'm taking a shower, I get to get in bed. We need to talk about this. And so what happens is we don't realize from zero to five, our children need our time they need our focus. We need to persevere with them and help them to teach how to handle situations. Our children need to feel then respected. As Cooper's telling me, I'm taking a shower, mom. It's 10 o'clock, I gotta get a bed. But I'm like, we've gotta talk about this because I, in my mind, wanna arm him with the peer pressures and with life situation. And you know what? I've gotta ultimately trust my God. I've gotta ultimately realize that I can't dismiss him Look, I've got to talk to you about this right now, or when, you know, in whatever age he is, I've got to not over talk situations. I cannot allow myself to allow my emotions or my fears to take a hold of me. He's got to see me emulate perseverance, patience, and kindness. He's got to see these things. So in James chapter one, can you? Yeah, um, I'll, read, I'll read it. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, James chapter one. Uh, Verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and will be it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. And then all the way down to verse 12, it says, a man who endures trial, trials is blessed, because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This was a staple scripture in our family. You know, bottom line, peer pressure is just a lack of our children's connection to seeing God in their lives. They're going to be tested. And if you read the scripture and have it on an index card on their, you know, or read it to them before they go to school or put it on their mirror or do something. But I don't mean kids at age 10 to 18. I mean, children from zero to five. When you're reading scriptures, help them to see the scriptures come alive. Help our children to see God. And so with peer pressures versus perseverance, it's not, don't focus on the fact that they will get peer pressure. They will. We know 95 to 5% of kids will. It's how we teach them to persevere through these trials. And so Bailey and Cooper do know the scripture. So what are some practicals? You know, to teach our kids perseverance is that when you're taking them outside and you're teaching them through a scavenger hunt, persevere, dude, you didn't get it right. When you're hiking in the woods and, and the woods are getting a little bit like, oh, it's muddy, I don't like it. Persevere, hon. 
you know, and you could talk to them about, and they'll start talking to you. They'll be so tired. They'll be telling you things that are happening at school. This is an opportunity for you to be talking to them and getting things out of them. We got to finish up. In, we're not going to go back. We've got to finish up this hike on the woods. Yard work. Some of us as parents, we'd rather do yard work by ourselves because we do it faster, better, quicker. And some dads like doing yard work just to, or women like to garden because we want to get away from life. Well, use that yard work to let your kids be a part of your life and use it to talk. And so cooking together, taking, you know, everything I put down here, listen to podcasts together on perseverance. Sometimes I'll tell Bailey, hey, I found this really cool podcast. Can you, or this little video, and I send it to her. Hey, do you want to check it out? The Bible Project videos are great too. So I hope that this helps in understanding that it all comes to it. We could give you all the practicals about peer pressure, but let's teach our children how to persevere and knowing that God is on their side. Yeah, one of the things that we tried to do, especially about teaching that perseverance and preparation for um, the peer pressure, was that we had a kind of a roadmap for each kid. And each child, even though they grew up in the same household, are so different. I'm sure you guys see the same thing. Your children grow up in the same household. You do a lot of things together. Our kids could not be two different kids. So for Bailey up top, you know, she loves dark comedies and we would watch them and laugh and goof on things. When she was a, a preteen, the Twilight books were and the movies were all the rage. You know, instead of just letting her go off and read them, I read them first. Then I then we discussed them. So when there was some questionable content, it was an opportunity for me to talk to her about um, sex, talk to her about temptation, talk to her about what was inappropriate. And so I used those books as opportunities. I know some people are like, no, no, I won't let my kids read that. I read it with them. I didn't let her just go off and read it. Um, we had, she was a part of a national championship cheerleading squad. Uh, we attended every competition every. as a family. Every. Cooper was there. We were there. We flew to Florida together every year. Five, four out of five years, she, she was a national champion. And so uh, we, we definitely, that was her thing, right? But for Cooper, when he was younger, it was all about video games. And I got to tell you, I stunk. But I would play with him. I'd spend time with him playing. It was so bad once that I was playing a, a game with him online with some other kids. And this kid sent me a text message over the game. And I was like, Cooper, how'd that, what happened? Uh, someone sent me a note. He goes, open it, dad. And all it said was, you stink. And I was like, dad, Coop, I, I guess I'm that bad. But I mean, look, I spent hours playing with him. Uh, I went fishing with him. Uh, we went to every one of his lacrosse and, and wrestling matches because that was important. And we and I, I we mentioned this because each of our children were different in what they did, so we had to meet needs. And oftentimes there were some conflicting schedules, but we had to make sure that we were spending time. And to me, the car rides to these events were priceless. We had great talks. We we listened to music. We had a, a wonderful time together, and so we took advantage of the time. So one of the things here we wanted to share, Proverbs 22, verse 6, you all know the scripture by heart, you know, train a child in the way they should go, right? And they will never depart. You know, guys, I, one of the things is when you're speaking with our with the children, I used, I corrected myself over time. I have to be honest with you. Um, I think my goal was always, my goal is to help my child get to heaven. And I realized I've retracted. And don't get upset at me here, but the reality is our job is for them to get to know God mm -hmm. because there are children that haven't made it. Mm -hmm. And so as parents, you guys are amazing here. You're spending your Friday night listening, uh, taking notes, figuring some, many of you guys know a lot of the stuff that we're sharing, yeah. but there's a reason why we prayed really diligently that whatever had to be said had to be said tonight, but our goal is for to teach our children about God and the knowledge of him, right? Yeah. And so think about the fact that you, we put more pressure on ourselves, more pressure on our kids because they feel that they have to make us happy. Make us happy either becoming Christians, make us happy when it comes to becoming um, great at school, do great 
as a brother or sibling. And so they're under their own pressure with us. So here, training and turn the way- can I, can I share something? Sure. So, so there, there's a brother who, who shared with me recently, um, two of his, he has, he has adult children now, but, but two of his children have become Christians and have since um, stopped coming to church. And, um, and he, he shared with me that he had to go back and apologize to his kids because he felt like his love was conditional. It was conditional based on them being a part of the church and that he, he felt like he was not loving them the way Jesus had loved him, forgiving them and taking care of them the way God had forgiven him. And so as adults, he's gone back and apologized, restored that relationship. And I, I was really impressed by that, that humility. And, and I thought, you know, that to me is, is being present and, 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 and knowing when to restore the connection that might have been broken between the, the parent and the child. I think also being present, I'll talk about this one because this was the biggest challenge for me. Um, there were times where I'd have my cell phone at the dinner table um, and I'm, I'm responding to emails for work. And, and when the kids were younger, they saw that. They knew I was distracted. They knew that I wasn't giving them their focus. And um, that is key, right? Because if they're not getting, like Arlene said earlier, the respect and the connection, they're going to seek it elsewhere. They're going to seek it through medicating. They're going to seek it through friendships. And they'll do anything to keep those friendships because that's the only connection they have if they don't have it at home. And so that's why it's key. So guys, Zero to 10 years old, I learned this through good enough parenting, and maybe many of you guys probably took the class. They're cognitive, they're kind of frontal lobe, what they what they learn. The first 10 years is very critical in a child's life. And so realize that that zero to 10, what we do and how we are responsive to them and, and how they feel around us will determine the trajectory of their future from 10 to 18 and so on. So Steve and I would have a one-on-one -on -one time. And again, it's very key here. Doesn't matter the gender. Steve was very good when it came to um, um, being with Bailey. I, I have to tell you guys, you know who read the sex book to Bailey? You know that little book that you tell about sex to children? It was him. I know I was a coward. I was like, how are we going to read this? I, don't, I can't read this. I can't read this. And he's like, I'm going to read it. I have the book. So many of you young parents, or if you haven't done it, some of you guys go, what's the sex book? There's these two volumes. Let's talk about it. But he read the book to her at an early age. So bedtime, talking about what was your high, what was your low of your day? Don't think, don't dismiss that. You have to just do that with little kids. Do that with your 10-year-old and so on. Steve, Cooper and I and Bailey still do it. You know, fight to have spiritual aunts and uncles. You know, we have to build that community of people around us. Steve and I really believe in traditions and we really believe in those aunties and uncles. Guys, it is so key. Inv you know, just, it's so key. I have some of your kids, actually, one of them texts me at night just to see how my day is. She's a teen. And so, and I'm like, feel like I'm, she goes, you're my second mommy. You're my Puerto Rican mommy. And I'm like, all right. What, one of the things that we, I, I, I want to say it was God who inspired us, but I can't take credit for it. I, I knew because when I was a teen, I felt like my parents didn't understand me. I knew that my kids would hit a point when they looked at us and said, you guys don't get it. So what I did was I did the preemptive strike and we started building relationships when they were younger so that, and we told them this, if you ever feel like you can't, that we don't understand you, you can go to Tony and Mimi. You can go to Jim and Teresa. You can go to Dave and Inez. You can go to Gabe and Mary. These are people that were so instrumental and to this day are still reaching out to our kids, connecting with them at different times. And, and, but we built that from a young age because we knew that the lion never sleeps and he was going to wait for that moment when they felt like mom and dad don't listen. 
and they never listen. And then where would they turn? They would turn to their friends. And that's where peer pressure becomes this incredible force where they, most children cave in and do something that they regret. We were very fortunate. Our kids had a web of people that we built. And this is the community Arlene was referring to. And it's so important. I believe it is very, it's a biblical concept that we have to have a community around us. So from zero to 10 to 10 to 18, and we'll look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. Cooper confessed some heavy things to his little community. Yeah. And they said to Cooper, if you don't confess it to your, the team leader and to your parents tonight, we're going to tell them. Mm -hmm. And so we lived in each other's houses. Mm -hmm. So we created these. So the next, it says in the notes, it says creating family traditions. We invited people to our house was a haven. So we do cooking nights, lasagna nights, and those teens would come over to our house. Sometimes they would say, hey, I just want to spend time with you, Miss Arlene. You know, whether Cooper comes home late from lacrosse or not, I just want to hang out with you. Yeah. But those are the kids that saved my son yeah. because yeah. we fought. It didn't matter how long and distant we were. Like we lived 40 minutes from certain disciples, 30 minutes. They show up. Right. So, um, so, I, so we just wanted to share that traditions and building a community is key to the longevity of your children. Yeah, we had we had a lot of traditions that we created in the sense like for for holidays or birthdays, or we did things very special and we opened up the home so that people could come in. Uh, but, but now for the older kids, right? And I, I said it earlier, it's never too late to start, right? The transition from school age to high school can be difficult, right? These are the kids that are becoming individuals. They're trying to figure out their place in the world. Um, this is where the rebellion comes in. This is where you can no longer tell them, do as I say, right? When they were younger, we used to tell Bailey and Cooper, just, just do what I tell you to do. When they became 12, 13, it was like, why, why? And it became more relational. We had to have more of a late, we had to explain a lot more. We had to ask a lot of questions. Well, if you did that, what would happen? You know, and, and really there was a desire on both of our parts to constantly learn. We read so many books from so many different authors and we got so much advice from so many people. Um, Sam and Jerry Lang's son, Jonathan, you heard from him uh, a few months back. He's one of my best friends. How did we get to know each other? Well, I hired him uh, first into one of my companies, but then he helped me with Cooper. He helped me with hey. Bailey. Um, he, I would get advice from him. He's a lot younger than I am, but I still would get advice from him. I'd ask him, you know, what did your dad do? What did your mom do? How did, and, and it was just awesome. And then he'd get advice from me on different things. And, and so that, that desire to learn and study our kids was, was insatiable. He taught us that. He said, don't allow your fears to dictate your relationship with your child. You guys, we, we're not going to agree with our children. Does that make sense? Like, there's just things that I'm like, I don't get it. But that's my job to be willing to be humble enough and ask them to explain it to me yeah. and to seek to understand. And so many times I do as a mom, I have to bite my tongue and just listen. Mm. Listening is the hardest thing. Mm. Connecting with them with something that we don't understand, you know, I think of the scriptures, you know, all scriptures, God breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, and training, and righteousness. I'm going, God is teaching me the Bible. He's telling me I've got to be able to submit to the word, submit to being like Jesus, to listen more than I speak. I've got to be righteous with my tongue. I've got to be righteous with my eyes. And so Stephen and I would love to still carpool. We're the ones that would go to Camp Hope or Camp in Philadelphia. Yep. And we'd take a band of kids because we wanted to hear what they were saying. I would also I would also carpool his lacrosse team. And I would raise my hand, I'll, I'll drive the kids. And then I would drive them and then I would just remain silent. And I heard so much. I wouldn't interrupt them. I would hurt, I would hear things that were outrageous. But I, I was so tempted to interrupt him and go, Cooper, how dare you talk about someone that way? But I never did it in front of his friends. So I, when we got home, I was like, hey, Coop, well, after you take a shower, let's talk. And Arlene did the same thing. I was like, you know, 
that conversation when you talk about that guy, you know, how would you feel if someone talked about you that way? Why did you feel the need to contribute to that? Oh, dad, everybody was ragging on him. And but so I helped him deal with the peer pressure. I didn't do it in the moment because I didn't want to embarrass him. Embarrassing him in front of his friends would have been wrong. But so it was that teaching moment that later we were able to. So that carpool was like invaluable. But the other thing, too, is <clears throat> there were times that we chose not to bring up a subject up because I think that their opinion is their opinion. Does that make sense? We don't want them to sin, but sometimes we have to ask more questions because we might have an opinion as to why were you guys talking that way? <clears throat> but we realized that there was more to it behind the scenes. We jump to conclusions and what happens is we don't hear them out yeah. and they feel judged by us. They don't feel respected. They don't feel listened. And so here we're trying to train. I, I read this book that said, here we're training this child since they were a baby to be smart and independent and confident and feel valued and feel empowered. And then the moment they say something I don't agree, I shut it down. Why are you saying that? You know, instead, well, help me understand. How does that boy treat people? What's going on? Then we get the real deal. But we're like piranhas. Well, right. I know I was like, a, like jumping and, and trying to close and, oh, I didn't want him to sin. But in reality, is here the very nature that I prayed about for him to grow up to be this adult. I was squashing him. Now, I know, I know we're running short on time. We've got one more point that we want to share with you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to ask for forgiveness from the Chiquikways right now. But um, there's the last the last point in the practicals is what they watch how you live. And then I've got like two more slides. I think it's important to talk about that our children have to see Jesus in us before they will ever decide to study the Bible. And, you know, oftentimes we will tell our kids or they'll hear it at church. You got to seek the kingdom first. You got to make kingdom decisions. But then they look at our lives and they find compromise. You know, they see us compromise when it comes to that stuff. Or they'll hear on Sunday that anger, rage, vengeance, or a lack of forgiveness, gossip, or sins, but then they see it in the home. They hear us talk about people. or And, and so that's how they learn compromise, hypocrisy. And when they see hypocrisy and compromise, it makes them more susceptible to peer pressure because they don't see the power of God. And so one of the things that I did very often to my kids was I would ask them, do you see me being one way at home and one way at church? And I allowed them the opportunity to be blunt with me. Um, I'm happy to say most of the time they were like, no, dad, you're the same all the time. Um, there were times where I was grumpy at work and they were like, dad, I, I think you're being grumpy, you know, and, and I think you're being, you're not being nice to mom. And so I allowed that because I wanted them to see, I would confess, ask for their forgiveness and repent right in front of them, because that is what our children need. The last point is about the power of forgiveness and restoration. I'm going to, this is important. This is a big one for me. Um, in Exodus 32, you see about Aaron and the golden calf. And, and we don't have time to read it. I apologize. Uh, but go back and read it. You'll, you guys know the story, but what's most powerful about the story is that Moses went up to the mountain and uh, the people were like, wow, Moses is taking a long time. You know, build us a calf. And he caved to peer pressure. He caved because the Israelites lost their gratitude for God. He caved into the pressure of the people. And he was like, all right, I'll build you a calf. Give me all your gold. And he built this calf. And what's most interesting to me, and I read this, Arlene and I were noticing this this week. He lost sight of God. He became impatient. What's interesting is that in verse 9, God says, I have seen these people. The Lord said to Moses, and there are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, and then I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. I never realized until I read that, you know, preparing for this, that God put some pressure on Moses to be the second Abraham. 
He said, I will destroy this nation and I'm going to create another nation from you. I don't know about you guys, but if I were the leader of the Israelites, I'd be like, yeah, let's get started. Let's do it now. Those people, they're, they're a bunch of stiff necked. Moses didn't. He actually told God, no, God, remember, you know, the, remember the Egyptians. They're going to think you brought them into the desert to destroy them. Moses didn't cave into the pressure that God put on him. Now, I believe God knew Moses would do that, but I never viewed it that way. And then God restored Moses and God both restored and forgave Aaron. And when you look in, in Exodus 39, one of the coolest things was, I, I, I was like, wait a second, they never really talked about this. And it says, from blue and purple scarlet yarn, they made woven uh, garments for ministering to the sanctuary. They also made sacred garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. There was forgiveness. There was restoration. Aaron then became the high priest and his family, his tribe then became high priest for all eternity. And I think that's God. That's God and his power of forgiveness and restoration. And I want you to think, how are you when your kids make mistakes? You know, do you embody the same type of forgiveness and restoration that God did? I mean, look, we all know our kids got to become sinners in order to be saved. But when that happens, how are we with them? Do we exhibit the same type of, I mean, not only did God forgive Aaron, he exalted him and put him at a high place. This was the guy who built the golden calf. Why could he be, how could he be the high priest? And so I want you to think about it because when your children mess up and they will, how will you handle it? My prayer is that we'll handle it the way God did because Aaron, man, did Aaron make a turn because of forgiveness and restoration. So peer pressure is, it's inevitable, right? Peer pressure will happen and they will fall. It's, we've got to be willing to show them the grace that God showed us. Yeah. One of the things in terms of the connection and even earlier, Steve talked about how that our children can watch us. Guys, it's not that they just watch us on how we respond to them. They're watching our lives in terms of, are we hospitable, right? Are we having people over? It was so encouraging to hear that Jeremy, you know, just what Jeremy and Beth said, you know, how they wanted to start looking for a new house. Because the reality is we are so grateful. And what happens with grateful heart? We used to tell our kids, happy heart, you know? And they're like, happy heart. And then I was like, okay, now they're just saying it, but they don't mean it. But we taught our children early on to be grateful because gratefulness, what happens with gratefulness? brings joy yeah and so what happens is then they are joyful because they're so grateful for what they have that they want to share their toys so mm -hmm. i like sharing my toys i love having people over i like opening up the refrigerator yes you could come over for charcuterie <laughs> but we will have things in abundance because we're just so grateful for what god's given us yeah and this so, this last scripture is the one that we really taught our kids early on right that that there will be temptation this was a memory scripture that we made them memorize. No temptation is overtaking you. It is not common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I'm doing the old NIV from 1984. <laughs> but when you are tempted, he will provide you a way out so that you can stand up under it. And this was a scripture we had them memorize. And, and so in closing, I want you guys to remember you, you have to build your community. I like this image because it really, it, it shows the number of hands that need to surround our children. It just can't be us. We, I knew that going in. And so we have to build that community. We have to be very, very deliberate in how we have relationships with our kids outside of us. You heard us talk about practicing hospitality. You know what? There's actually a scripture, in there, <laughs> right? So Romans 12, 13 talks about practicing hospitality. Open up your home. We opened up our homes because we wanted to get to know their friends from school. We wanted to get to know their friends' families. We wanted to know, we would go to their house. It wasn't just drop the kids off for a play date. We'd bring pizza. We'd stay with the parents. It was, 
One of the, the reason that's then, so key I wanted to yeah. share was I've studied the Bible with some of Cooper, with Cooper's friends. Mm -hmm. And that was my network of people. But being a disciple isn't just going to church on Sunday. I wanted to show them that or midweek service. We wanted them to see that we were trying to be like G Jesus by bringing people in and loving them because that's all throughout the whole Bible, right? And so, you know, when it says collect and create memories, Cooper, <laughs> this is hysterical. Cooper's like, when we go to ASU and we rent a Airbnbs, he has the whole campus ministry always coming. Hey, are we going to watch football? Hey, mom, are you cooking? Are we going to go to, you know, Costco's and pick up food? He, he's continuing these memories on to even college. Yeah. And, and, and I, I like this collecting moments, not things, because I think the world teaches us to collect things. And whether that be, um, you know, degrees, career, toys, whatever they are, and, and the toys get more expensive as you get older. We, when our kids like, gosh, man, I remember St. Patrick's Day. I mean, again, it, it doesn't have to be like a religious holiday, right? St. Patrick's Day, we would make Aww. corned beef and cabbage every year. And we, or we would go to a restaurant and get it. Cooper was in ASU yeah. and we couldn't find a place for him to go get it. He was bummed. He tried to get friends to go. And it was because we had created this tradition where we would go and get. We're not Irish. We're, we're not Irish, but but again, take advantage of. For me and Arlene, it's like whatever the excuse to have time together and bond, and then no. never stop studying and learning about your children. These are to me four of the, you know, bedrock things that we have done that have helped our kids deal with with peer pressure. So I apologize for taking a little extra time. We will take questions. We'll try to answer them the best we can. I'll take a look at the chat.